Raised by wolves with canine DNA in his blood. Having trained more than 24,000 vets. Helping you and your fur babies thrive. Live in studio, it's Pet Talk Today with Will Bangura answering your pet behavior and training questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host and favorite pet behavior expert, Will Bangura. Good Saturday morning, pet lovers. I'm Will Bangura. And I'm Jordan Marsteller. And you're listening to Pet Talk Today here on Facebook Live on the Pet Talk Today page. We are here each and every Saturday morning from 12 noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Pacific Time. Uh, if you're brand new to Pet Talk Today, let me talk a little bit about what we do here. Um... Every Saturday, like I said, we're here, and we are here to help you deal with all of your pet training and behavior issues. Not everybody can afford private in-home training, so this is a labor of love for us to try to help those people that might not otherwise be helped with their pets. So do us a favor, help us with our mission. Go ahead and hit that like button now. Please hit that like button, give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, we love you. And hit that share button as well. Share this video to your Facebook page. Like I said, there's a lot of people that can't afford uh, private training, um, so we're here to help them. Um, we'd like you to let us know that you're watching. If you would, in the comments section, go ahead and type in where you're from, and what kind of a pet that you have also absolutely also um we were we're going to take your questions we'll take your calls a little bit later on in the show um we will answer questions if you've got a question about your dog's behavior and training you can type that into the comment section yeah now a lot of shows we just do q a right. but then we've got shows where we have a very specific topic that we're going to talk about yeah. and today's topic is um, kind of a controversial topic and, and you know and more so than just being controversial last week i made the comment that you and i are nerds when it comes to training dogs yeah. when it comes to dogs we are such nerds and today is a topic that it's kind of a lot of people would call very nerdy. We're going to be talking about some pretty scientific stuff today. We really are. You know, when I say that behavioral medicine for dogs is controversial, in my mind, I don't understand why it's controversial. Yeah, okay? I don't get it either. And really, the first thing I want to say is uh -huh. that the brain is an organ. Absolutely. And the brain is an organ, just like um, the heart, the liver, the lungs, the kidneys, the pancreas. Yeah. And when one of our other organs in our body gets sick or gets diseased, yeah. we don't say, hey, wait a minute, doctor, only as a last resort, only as a last resort will you be giving me that heart medication. Yeah. Only as a last resort are you going to give me medication so I don't die of pancreatitis. Yeah, absolutely. Only as a last resort am I going to take that chemotherapy. Right. We forget that the brain is an organ. Absolutely. And it gets sick and it gets diseased like any Anything other organ. Else. And I think a lot of times the reason that people can't grasp that um, somehow they think that their thoughts run their brain. Yeah. Tell me what kind of a thought you had before you had a brain. That's a good question. What kind of thoughts and feelings did you have before you had a brain? None. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Your didn't. brain is running the show, folks. Okay. Now, that being said, there are plenty of dogs yeah. that are being medicated and two things. Number one, they don't need it. Right. Number two, the choice of medications being used are not something that most dog owners yeah. are going to want 
because their dogs are zombies. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. I want to go ahead and say, whenever we are medicating a dog or recommending, because we are not veterinarians, we are not veterinarians. I can just give my recommendations based off of my experience and based off of the research that I've done. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever I recommend a certain medication for a dog, I'm looking at what I believe to be the culprit in the dog's brain at that time. If, if you, if your body is not appropriately producing insulin, mm -hmm. your doctor is not going to prescribe you ibuprofen, right? Your doctor's going to put you on an insulin pump. If your brain is not appropriately producing dopamine, maybe we need to fig figure out something that's going to increase those levels of dopamine. Exactly. You know, that's, and so a lot of people, they say, I see it all the time. They're like, I don't want my dog to be a zombie. I don't want your dog to be a zombie either, but I want all of the neurochemicals to be aligned in your dog's brain at appropriate levels. You know, if a dog is taking, first of all, let me just say this. Yeah. Cause everybody's got their opinion about behavior medicine with, with their pets, with dogs. I want to say this. If you can tell that the dog is on medication. Somebody did something wrong. Absolutely. If you can tell the dog is on medication, somebody has made a mistake. Absolutely. Because what that means is, is that the dog is a zombie and the dog is sedated. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the biggest concerns that yeah. pet owners have is my dog's going to be a zombie. Yeah. You know, they think psych meds. They think, oh my God, my dog's going to be yeah. a zombie. It's, it's personality is going to go away. Yeah. Um, it's fun loving spirits going to go away. I don't want that because I'm, I'm a dog lover. Yeah. I'm not just a dog trainer. Yeah. I'm not just a behavior specialist. I'm a dog. I'm an animal lover. I want you, my client, to enjoy your dog. That's it. That's the reason that I'm here rehabilitating your aggressive dog because you can't enjoy an aggressive dog. Right. You can't enjoy an anxious dog and you can't enjoy a zombie doped up dog either. Exactly. So I'm not going to recommend those things. And for everybody uh, in the questions, in the comments, um, specifically, we have Janice. She said, how, what do we feel about ace promazine for a dog that may attack? And you know, actually that medication is something that we're going to address. Yeah, today. We're going to address we're different, going to address we're going to address different medications. medications, but we do yeah. want to put out that, um, disclaimer that Jordan and I are not veterinarians. Right. All right. We work with a lot of dogs yeah. that have behavior problems right. that require behavioral medication Absolutely. in conjunction with behavior modification. Um, so we see a lot of that population. Yeah. And I, I get upset when I see somebody who may have already had their dog on medication. The dog's yeah. a zombie. Absolutely. Um, and, and there's some issues too, folks. Um, the first thing that you need to understand is that your veterinarian has little to no training and education in behavior. Your veterinarian yeah. has little to no uh, training and education in psychopharmacology. Guys, let me tell you something. I am currently Not working towards my doctorate of veterinary medicine, and I have looked at all of my coursework. If I remember correctly, I am going to be taking two classes on general animal behavior right that's and, it. and we're talking it's got to encompass horses yep pigs chickens cats yeah dogs ferrets birds bearded dragons yeah, exactly you name it okay <laughs> um a veterinarian is a huge generalist and i've got all the respect in the world Absolutely. for a veterinarian they can't ask their patient hey what's going on with you what's i know wrong? imagine that I'm, and uh, and you know one appointment they might be dealing with a snake the next appointment they're dealing with a cat the appointment after that they're dealing with a rabbit then comes in a dog so my god bless them for knowing everything Absolutely. they know with physical medicine absolutely but when we're talking about behavioral medicine um the folks that know the most are going to be your veterinarian behaviorist, Absolutely. veterinary behaviorist. Absolutely. And they are regular veterinarians. In addition to that, they've done additional schooling, yeah. additional internships, um, research, and they specialize in behavioral medicine. Absolutely. Um, 
Now, that's not to say that some regular veterinarians are not prescribing behavioral meds. For, no, for I, I see it all the time. Cats. I see it all the time. Um, and sometimes they're getting it right. Yeah. And sometimes they're, well, I question why. Yeah, what absolutely. They, what they prescribe. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of people in the comments are making comments about, you know, their dog being on medication and it causing them to be, you know, loopy and droopy and zombie. Well, here's the thing, guys. Even when you prescribe a medication that is not supposed to be sedating, there's lots of potential side effects. And these are things that that your veterinarian may not know. Like if you put a dog on Prozac that is not supposed to be taking Prozac, we are inviting the possibility of serotonin syndrome when we increase the levels of serotonin too high in the dog's brain. Now, that may possibly cause your dog to be extremely lethargic, but it may also cause your dog to be extremely manic. Yeah. You know? And, and here's the thing. Um, there's lots of dogs out there that don't need to be on medication. Absolutely. But there are more dogs that need to be on medication that are not. Right. And I'm not here to debate the subject because everything we do on Pet Talk today is based in science, based in research. And we're not talking about one scientific study. We're talking about multiple studies, peer-reviewed, in peer-reviewed journals. Um, there is no debate. Right. There's no the debate. The evidence is there. The it's evidence there. is there. Um, what it comes down to is how do you diagnose, what do you look for when you suspect that a contributing factor, and that those are important words, Absolutely. contributing factor is a neurochemical imbalance. Absolutely. Something going on with their brain. Absolutely. That is impacting how they are perceiving yeah. what's going on. So the communication coming in. Yeah. See, the brain is a filter. And yeah. dogs are not always responding to external stimuli. Right. There sometimes is the intrinsic internal stimuli that's going on. And it's never one thing when it comes to behavior. Yeah. You know, there's that whole debate, nature versus nurture, okay, right. as far as behavior. How much of behavior is shaped by um, your experiences? Absolutely. Nurture. How much of your behavior is determined by nature? Yeah. Genetics, biology, physiology, neurochemistry, neurobiology. And it's a combination of both. Yeah, absolutely. Um. And there's, there's a lot of other contributing factors. In fact, again, in the comments, Xenia is asking if we have an opinion on the thoughts about the influence of the gut biome. And again, that is something that we're going to be addressing because Absolutely. medication is not the first step that I take. It is not. When I'm evaluating a dog, believe it or not, gut biome is one of the big it's things huge. that I look at. It's it is one of absolutely the absolutely huge. And, and we can just say something right now. Yeah. Your gut health. Is yeah. critical to your brain health. I don't 80%. care if you're. I don't care if you're a dog, you're a cat, you're a human being. Eighty percent of serotonin, your neurotransmitter, one of the happy neurotransmitters that you can have in your brain, is produced in your gut. And yeah. if you've got bad gut health, you're not going to have good brain health. Absolutely, absolutely. And so we do look at that, and yeah. we look at the whole dog. We're looking at all kinds of physical contributing factors environmental contributing factors, developmental contributing factors, past traumas. Exactly. What a, there's so many things that we look at. There are so very many things, but Hey, you know what? I, I know that something that really will help. And I, I know that we're going to, we're going to get to it actually here soon mm -hmm. is if you guys hear from somebody that is just like you, in fact, we will be hearing from one of my own clients today. Um, who I recommended we put onto a behavior medication. And I'd love for you guys to hear what she has to say. And again, we want to inform you. Yeah. We want to educate you because there are, and I'll say it again, there are more dogs that need to be on medication that are not than dogs that are on medication that should yeah. not be on medication. Absolutely. Okay. And the biggest reason is lack of knowledge. Yeah. Um, 
that word ignorance is not a bad word. It just means no. without knowledge. And that's what I tell my clients all the time. They go, I have clients where they, they, they start beating themselves up because they were so against behavior medication. Mm-hmm. And then I recommended it and they finally, they finally pulled the trigger and it really, really helped their dog. And they're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm the worst dog owner ever, blah, blah, blah. I'm such a terrible dog mom or dog dad. And I'm like, no, no, you are one of the best. You know why? Because you already took the step that a lot of other people don't take. And that was, you called me and you did the best that you could with the knowledge that you had. Exactly. Exactly. So what are some of the things that we would look for when kind of deciding whether or not a dog uh, needs medication? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the first, well, first of all, I'll tell you what, let's, let's do this first yeah. before we talk about that. What are some of the issues? Yeah that would lend themselves to a dog like for example a dog that's got a jumping problem would we medicate that absolutely not what about not a dog what jumping. about a dog that's just barking like crazy no we're just gonna we're yeah. just gonna do some what, some what about a dog that just chewing stuff up you know uh, now when we start to get into chewing i'm gonna have to look a little bit deeper into that okay i'm gonna start asking questions like how often is your dog chewing? When is your dog chewing? What kinds of things is your dog chewing? If the answer is my dog is just about, you know, 13 weeks old, 14 weeks old, up to six months, and is just chewing on stuff. Maybe I'm noticing that there's teeth laying around the house. I'm probably going to say you might have a teething problem going yeah, puppy. on. Yeah, that's a normal stuff, right? Teething. But then if you start to tell me, yeah, my dog only chews when I'm not around and freaks out in the kennel well maybe we might be looking at separation anxiety and i gotta look a little bit deeper and i gotta start asking some more questions so there are certain behaviors that are going to lend themselves more to the possibility that there's a neurochemical contributing factor and we may need to add medication on top of training and behavior modification and the thing that we look at is emotional states. Yeah. Okay. So a dog that's jumping, what's their emotional state? Probably excited. They're just happy, right? I yeah. want to see somebody, you know, I'm excited to see somebody. It's typically that barking. Now, barking again, I might have to look a little bit into it. Mm-hmm. What kind of barking? When mm-hmm. is the barking happening? Is it only at strangers? Mm-hmm. Is your dog cowering while barking? Mm-hmm. Are you leaving it? Is your dog barking for the next 10 hours? Exactly. Okay. Until it's hoarse. Exactly. So... A lot of nuisance behaviors are not going to be behaviors that dogs typically are going to need behavioral medicine. Yeah. But the things that typically might, I say yeah. might, okay, there's nothing that's completely black and white when we're talking about behavior. But some of the areas that dogs might need behavioral medicine for are fears. Fears, absolutely. Now, I'm not talking about your dog is scared of the broom or your dog is scared of the vacuum. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about severe fear. Your dog is terrified. Phobias. Yeah. Your dog has certain items that just absolutely, it cannot be near noises, certain types of items. Maybe it's hats, maybe certain vases, things like that. Separation anxiety. Absolutely. Is your dog hurting itself? What does your dog do when you leave it? Is your dog having a panic attack? Yeah. When your dog leaves, is it drooling? What is, is it destroying exactly, the house? Is what it is a panic attack? Trying to get out, like yeah. scratching at the door, biting at the crate, breaking its teeth off. It's panicking. Yeah, exactly. Um, aggression. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Aggression. Seriously. You know, I'll get a lot of trainers yeah. that will complain that... Um, for dogs that are aggressive, they don't uh-huh. need to be on medication that you just need to show them who's boss. Oh my gosh. Dominance theory, right? I love it. Not really. Show I hate boss. dominance theory. You show them who's boss. You know, they're doing it because they can get away with it. Thanks. See that's, Milan. that's the mentality. Okay. Yeah. That's so wrong. That's so wrong. You know why? You know why? Will, in my experience, the thousands and thousands of dogs that I've ever trained in aggression specifically, only once would I ever label one of those dogs as dominant aggressive. One single time. Every other time out of these thousands of cases, it has been fear-based aggression. I am even skeptical of that. And the reason I'm skeptical is because it's my contention, no animal, regardless, 
goes into fight or flight unless they perceive something as threatening. Absolutely, because cortisol, so, norepinephrine, these things are required to turn on fight or dominance flight. Dominance is almost like, well, the dog's doing it for to get its kicks. Right. And But you got to remember, this dog specifically, we neutered this dog and the problem, gone. This dog, this was that dog that was, uh, that would hump the pillow every single day until ejaculation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, I wouldn't call that necessarily dominance okay though. okay i, I that's don't know fair. what i would call that dominance but you know there's hormonal factors yeah. that, that certainly can come into it yeah um but we'll talk about fears phobias anxiety general anxiety separation anxiety aggression ocd yeah no. we call it actually we call it ocd in, for in, people but it's um obsessive uh, compulsive in, canine in fact, yeah. syndrome in fact um the client that we'll be speaking to today her name is sarah mm-hmm. um her dog was participating in a lot of OCD behaviors. Oh, okay. um, elimination disorders. Yeah. Now, we're not talking about your run-of-the-mill potty training issues. Yeah, no, no. Okay. Um, self-mutilating behavior. Yeah. Dementia. Yeah, canine cognitive dysfunction, or disorder, yeah, dysfunction. Yeah. So dogs can get dementia. They can get Alzheimer's, just like people. Um, and that is a cognitive impairment. And we've got medications that can help with Exactly. That. And then I have criteria that I lay out when I'm looking at all of these things. There's certain things that I look at. The first thing I look at is, is the threat real or is it imagined? Is there Give me an example of that. Okay, for example. Give me, a, give me an example of a real threat. Yeah. And the dog's behavior. Here's a real threat. If somebody was to come into the house with a big old stick, Uh angry and yelling and swinging that stick towards the dog, coming up towards your dog, just going crazy like he was Mm -hmm. going to attack your dog, that is a real threat. Your dog should be going crazy, hiding, or even attacking. Right. That is real imagined threat if every single time that somebody walks in your door and they're just quiet not even paying attention to the dog just minding their own business your dog just sees them and it's like growling lunging or hiding cowering that's an imagined threat there's no real threat present at all why does your dog perceive that this person who just walked through the front door and is doing nothing not even paying them a mind is a threat that is imaginary Bringing a box into the house. That's imaginary. Why? And freaking out when a brand new lamp or a brand new table or a brand new box comes into the house. I have so many clients that say this. We got a dog that just is freaking out, Uh scared, won't go near it. And that box could be in that house for years. That box could be there. The dog could see it over and over and over again. And yet it is still extremely afraid. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that we look for when we suspect that there might be a neurochemical imbalance is, like you said, Jordan, is the trigger real or imagined? Exactly. Okay. Because a lot of dogs are reacting, going into fight or flight, going into panic, going into major stress, maybe becoming aggressive, yeah. and there's no real threat. Right. Um, so one of the things we look for is, is it real? Is right. there a real threat? Then the next thing that we look for is what is their response? Right. Okay. What is the severity of the response? Is their uh, reaction minor, minimal? Or is their reaction just way over the top, way over the top? What is today? Today is the 16th. It has been 12 days since the 4th of July. It makes sense that if during the fireworks, your dog was a little scared. Yes. That's okay. Mm -hmm. That's fine. It's loud noises. Your dogs have very sensitive ears. Yep. It also makes sense that maybe an hour after the fireworks ended, your dog was still a little little nervous. Nervous. Like what's going on a little bit. You know, we aren't expecting an immediate but now, you know, at least by the next morning, they're yeah, good. Yeah, exactly. like nothing ever happened, right? Exactly. Yeah, typical. But now normal. it's been 12 days 12 and your dog days still after, won't go outside. 12 days after the 4th of July, yeah. your dog won't go outside. Why? That is not a good recovery. That is not good recovery at all. That is, I look at it and I go, what would a normal thinking dog do? Mm-hmm. A normally rationally thinking dog that has proper neurochemicals, what are they going to do? You know, Startle is normal. 
Absolutely. Very um, normal. If, if, a, if that vase right there, right above your I'm head, gonna was jump. Gonna fall, you're going to jump. Yep. But you know what? You're going to go, wow, that kind of sucked and sit right back. Right. Down. I'm not going to be here four weeks from now freaking yeah. out that a vase is going to hit me. Exactly. Okay. So we're taking a look as the trigger or threat. Is it real or imagined? Right. Okay. And what is the severity of the response? Exactly. Does your dog just kind of startle or does your dog go run away because a, a, a lamp fell over and now is hiding in the bathroom and trembling, is like trembling, drooling. and that's our response. And you can't get the dog out for recovery days. How long when an event happens, how long does it take your dog to recover from that? How long does it take your dog to get back to normal? How long does it take your dog to get back to a happy, go lucky dog that doesn't have a care in the world? Absolutely. If we've got a situation where we bring a new lamp into the house and the dog is scared to death of this lamp mm -hmm. and it looks at it and its head comes down and its tail starts to tuck and it's trembling yep. and it's going and hiding and it's six months later and the dog still won't go into the room where that lamp was put in. What, you know, the dog didn't recover. No. It's taking forever. Now, some people might say, for example, you said, hey, this person comes in the door. They're not a threat. They don't care about the dog. But yet the dog is really freaking out, acting aggressively, being yeah. very, very reactive. Um, viewing a threat when there's no real threat. Absolutely. The response is disproportionate to the situation because there's no real threat. Absolutely. Why are you acting as if you're in fight or flight? Exactly. And why are you in fight or flight? Yeah. Why is your, that's the, that's what I, th this is what I want you guys to realize here. Fight or flight is a natural response. It is turned on through a few neurochemicals. The main ones being cortisol and norepinephrine. Now it is not normal when, if will, my boss was to walk into the room and suddenly I just like start, I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? And I start trembling and freaking out, but he's just being a person. There is absolutely no reason why I should be doing that. My brain is now firing off neurochemicals mm -hmm. that should not be firing off. Exactly. That is the point that we're trying to make here. Now, there's a couple other things that are really important. When an animal, I don't care what the animal is, is in that state, what happens is their ability to think, their ability to learn, yeah. their ability to remember is greatly diminished because they are in fight or flight. And fight or flight occurs in the amygdala and the frontal cortex, which is where executive functioning, rationalized thinking, future planning, decision making Things like that. The occur ability there. to think, reason, and understand logic. It goes away because here's the thing. Only one person can drive the car at a time. Same thing with our brain. So when fight or flight turns on, which again originates in the amygdala, the amygdala is now driving the car. So the frontal cortex. It's in the back gone. seat. It's in the back seat. It's in the back seat. It's standing back. And, and so it's not just the severity of emotional distress that the dog or cat or animal is experiencing. Yeah. It's not just about that. It is also going to be about recovery time. Absolutely. And the severity. Now, yeah. some people might say, well, the reason that dog is so scared is because they were abused. And you know, here's the thing. Trauma, trauma's still a reason to potentially start medication. Now, the thing about it is, when we're talking about neurochemical imbalances, those things happen in a variety of ways. Yeah. You can be born with it. Yep. You could be born because there's a genetic history and that gets passed on genetically yep. um, dogs are mammals they have the same diseases and illnesses and syndromes that people have absolutely and do we medicate a lot of people that don't need to be do we over medicate a lot of people that don't need to be yep. yes are there a lot of people out there that need to be medicated that aren't yes and it's no different with the dogs yeah. when somebody says to me well you know the dog was abused 
First of all, most people that say that don't have any information to yeah, back that up. Exactly. They are looking at a dog that they might put their hand towards and, and the dog cowers, cowers down. and stuff like that. And so the natural assumption is the dog was abused. Let me tell you what a dog that was abused looks like. In fact, I have a client that I'm working with right now. Basically, this dog was an outside dog stuck on a chain, was literally rescued, stuck on a chain, and it would be locked in the kennel. And its owner was, he himself was also mentally disabled. He was, he had some mental disorders. And this dog would be locked in the kennel and he'd throw things at the dog inside of the kennel. He would hit the kennel with rocks and sticks and kick the kennel and things like that. Well, my client was working with the dog, was or had the dog, and her other dog started like gnawing on her kennel. And she kind of like slapped the kennel a little bit to get her dog to stop. Mm -hmm. For two weeks after that, the dog in question refused to go near the kennel. And anytime that the owner would like raise her voice even a little bit, yeah. even if she was excited, the dog would cower and run away and hide. Mm -hmm. That is a PTSD trauma response. Well, and again, it comes back down to is the threat real or imagined? And what is the dog's severity of response? Is the dog responding in a way that's just over proportionate to what is actually happening? Absolutely. And then the recovery time. How long does it take the dog to come back to normal baseline yeah. uh, mood? And, but people will say that, you know, that's just a training issue. That's just a training issue that you got to get them used to people. Well, again, yes, you're correct. You're right. But training alone, yeah. behavior modification alone is not going to change the physical structures in your brain. No, that's the thing. People don't realize that training when you have a neurochemical imbalance can only go so far. And when you have a neurochemical imbalance, medication can only go so far. You see, the thing that I hear, and I hear this from a lot of trainers, and trust me, they have good intentions. They just don't know, and they just don't know that they don't know. Right. Because they are not educated. Absolutely. Okay. And... I will hear from a lot of trainers that medication should be the last resort. And I started the show by saying, hey, um, if you had type 1 diabetes and your pancreas was not producing insulin, are you going to say, hey, insulin is a last case resort while, no. while you're sitting there no. in a coma? No. And that's why you need a behavior specialist or behavior consultant, a veterinary behaviorist to evaluate your dog and look and use their expertise to go, okay, you have a dog that is biting the owner, um, that is protecting its food bowl and is very aggressive to anybody that comes through the front door. And then I go, now again, I'm just throwing a random scenario out here. If this describes your dog, I'm not saying that I'm recommending this medication for your dog. And then I'm going to look at that dog and go, you know what? We might be looking at a serotonin deficiency. Maybe we should try something like Prozac or another SSRI. Exactly. Now people say, oh God, Prozac, it's going to make my dog a zombie. No, it won't. No, it won't. Not if it's the right medication. No, it won't. Now you may know somebody that's on Prozac and they might be a zombie. And I'm here to tell you, Prozac isn't the only medication they're on. Yeah. And it's not the Prozac that's making them a zombie. Okay. The medications, the most appropriate medications that are used today, again, you would not know they're on medication. And if you exactly. know that they're on medication, it's because, again, they're acting like a zombie. They're acting loopy. Yeah. That Maybe we put them on something is, like gabapentin. That is trazodone. not something that we're, we're looking for. Now, yeah. we're trying to restore the balance in the brain. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that your dog has to be a zombie. Now, do we have medications that sedate? Yes. Absolutely. Are they prescribed sometimes? Yes. Are there times when it's appropriate to prescribe them and times when it's not? Yes. And yes. And we'll get into that. And we're also going to get into, there are different types of medications. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about those and we'll talk a little bit about what 
we might look for yeah. where we think, well, maybe this medication might be better than that medication. And again, I just want to say it again, Jordan and I are not veterinarians. No. We're not giving out medical advice, but we work with a lot of dogs that are on behavioral medicine that need to be. And we see some amazing things with that. And um, it's just part of, part of what we do. Um, but before we do that, what do you say yeah. we bring Sarah into the mix. You want Absolutely. to go ahead and, and Absolutely. announce her? Hey, Sarah, can you hear us? Yes, can you perfect, hear me? Perfect, perfect, perfect. Yes, we can. We hear you loud and clear. Okay, so for those of you listening, this is Sarah, and she and I are working with her dog, Sammy. Okay, Sammy is a border collie. How old is Sammy, Sarah? Um, we're not really sure. We adopted him, and we um, think that he might be about seven years old, about but we're seven? not entirely sure. Yeah. yeah. So... I was hired by Sarah to work with Sammy for a few reasons, and I'm going to have her share those reasons with you. Yes, Sarah, if you could tell our viewers um, what kind of problems you were having, what was going on that prompted you to call Phoenix Dog Training? What was Sammy like? Um, Just kind of explain that for us. So when we first adopted him, he was there. He barked at us, of course, when he met us. Um, and we still adopted him because I loved him. Um, and it took probably seven months for him to even come out of the corner of our home. He was very OCD where he would chase his tail to the point where it would bleed. And he would cry when he caught it. He would hit his head off the wall from spinning. Um, And he is very, very people, fearful, aggressive. He does not enjoy strangers barking, lunging, growling, the whole, you know, deal. And it was very challenging because you can just tell by looking at him that he's scared, ears are back, tails between his legs. And I really didn't want my dog to live like that anymore. I wanted him to be happy. I wanted him to realize that, you know, strangers aren't going to kill you. So that's kind of why we looked into training, because we needed to nip these behaviors in the butt. Now, when you were looking into training, um, were you even thinking about medication? Um, so before we started training, I actually had him on Prozac. Okay. However, we didn't see a difference. You did not see a difference. Yeah, we did not see a difference at all. He was still obsessed with his tail. He was still really fearful. I mean, the first time Jordan met him, he couldn't even get near Sammy because Sammy was flipping out. And we put Sammy in his crate, and he actually bit the bars of his crate. He was freaking out so badly. Now... When you, did your regular veterinarian prescribe the Prozac? Yeah. Okay. And how long was your dog on Prozac? I would say at least a year. We stopped giving it to him because there was just no difference in his behavior. Okay. And then what happened when Jordan started working with you? Um, so after Jordan kind of saw the behaviors, he recommended, I'm going to butcher this name, but Chloma Prime Hydrochloride. And so it's Clomipramine. Yeah, he um, recommended this. We got it on him. And then almost immediately, we saw a huge change. I think Jordan came 13 days after we started the medication. And Sammy actually was able to meet him. And when we had Sammy in his crate, he wasn't barking. And I've also noticed a significant decrease in the tail chasing. If I remember now, correctly, Sarah, uh, that mm-hmm. second meeting, I don't know if you got the picture, but I'm pretty certain Sammy was pretty much laying in my lap on that yeah. second meeting. Yeah, he was. You actually said that you weren't going to reach your hands uh, to pet him and you were just going to see what he does. And he actually came to you yeah. and was snuggling with you. And it was so amazing to see. So, Sarah, I know that you said Sammy is seven. How old was Sammy when you got Sammy? Um, Probably five. Okay, so you've had him for two years. And those two years, yeah. one of those years, you had him on Prozac. Mm-hmm. And 
it sounds like the entire time, the two years that you had him, regardless of how many people he saw, regardless of what he was exposed to, he was having this very serious fear response. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 And then we suggested a medication other than Prozac. Yeah. Clomipramine. And um, one of the reasons that we suggested that medication is when we look at a dog's behavior, we look at that behavior and we say, okay, what neurotransmitters are affecting this type of behavior? And the thing about Prozac is Prozac almost exclusively works with serotonin. Yeah. And we have dogs sometimes that are very fearful, very withdrawn, um, and they don't seem to have a lot of pleasure. Out or of they're things. also OCD, like Sammy was. Right, OCD. Yeah. And um, we know that when we're looking at some of those behaviors, we're looking at norepinephrine. Yeah. And Prozac doesn't work with norepinephrine. And we're looking at dopamine. And Prozac doesn't work with dopamine. And so, again, folks, this is not to disparage any veterinarian. And there are some out there that have good knowledge of behavioral medicine. They're few and far between. It's not something that they went to school to learn. It's not something they need to learn. Um, and Prozac is kind of the go-to. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, that may have been a good choice. Yeah. Um, but when you know a little bit about brain chemistry, the neurochemistry, you can make a much better informed uh, decision Absolutely. about that. Um, if Sarah, if you were to take a look at Sammy mm -hmm. and you were to just take a look at his, you know, emotional makeup now versus before the clomipramine and if 10 would be the most severe that Sammy could be, and one is the least severe. Where was Sammy before the clomipramine? Again, 10 is the worst, one is the best. So when he is with me and he's with his, you know, his pack, he, other than, you know, the tail pacing, um, he was really calm and really loving and really happy. But the second he saw a stranger, he was on 10. I mean, it was the worst behavior of a dog I've truly ever seen. Gotcha. And where would you rescore that after the clomipramine? Oh, gosh. Honestly, Sammy's behaviors have decreased significantly. He does still have behaviors where he barks, but I would say it's at like a four now. And it's much easier to stop the behaviors before they start mm -hmm. and it's also easier to get him out of them now so intensity has gone down yeah frequency of the behavior has gone down yeah and well when i say intensity that also means severity but also his ability to recover is sped up yeah yeah absolutely we um we went to the park a couple weeks ago and he actually saw somebody on a bike and he was definitely not pleased that they were alive, mm -hmm. but he did not bark at them. He did not growl. Um, and then we went again the next day and he saw somebody and he kind of lunged at them, but he wasn't growling. He wasn't showing teeth. And it was about three seconds. And mm -hmm. then we were able to redirect him. And what would have happened before? Oh, he would have been doing the lunging. He would have been growling, snarling, barking. I mean, there would have been no stopping it. We would have had to pick him up and physically remove him. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and, and one of the things that, as you're saying this, Sarah, and it's so important for our viewers to know, never do we recommend medication in and of itself. No. Medication is a helper to the training and the behavior modification. Absolutely. And behavior modification and training should always go with medication absolutely, and the training and the behavior modification um takes time there yeah. are no quick fixes when I we're mean, talking about changing an emotional yeah. state the component that's neurochemical we can help with the medication 
But remember, I said early on, this is not a nature versus nurture. This is nature and nurture. Absolutely. This is about environment, experiences, past experiences, past traumas, you know, as well as uh, neurochemistry that's out of balance. And when we bring that neurochemistry in balance, we are able to help that component. But now we've got the behavioral component that is the learned aspect of it that we have to work with. And that behavior, even though it's less intense and it's less frequent and they recover quicker, this has become a habit. Yeah. It's been habituated. Mm-hmm. And Sarah saw a perfect example of that today because we actually had a training session early this morning. I think I was at her house at 6 a.m. Ah. Um, yes, you were. Early yeah. bird. And so I, if I remember correctly, yes, yeah, Sammy is doing so much better, but you saw it. That doorway and something about that area by the door. It's that habituated behavior that we have to work through. And you saw through yeah. the work that I was teaching you that it just takes baby steps and the medication doesn't fix everything. Right. So there is still work to be done. Sarah, if, if you had something that you wanted to say to viewers, if there was something you wanted them to know, what would you tell them? To just try new things. Um, I really thought that Prozac was kind of the only medication. I was unaware that there were other brands and that there were other chemistries. So whenever my vet didn't bring anything up, I just thought that, okay, it was over. I had no idea that this even existed. And I mean, I was definitely apprehensive about trying another medication because I just didn't think it was going to work. But I'm so happy that I tried it. I'm so happy that I've seen such an amazing difference in Sammy in just a couple of months. And, and we're glad that you were open to that because we see this type of positive response so many, yeah. many, many. This yeah. is the norm. Um, it's not the, it's not the exception. Exactly. And I've got chills just listening to you, Sarah, just hearing you say that it gives me chills because I love, this is what I love to do. This is my passion. And it makes me so happy to know that you understand now that Sammy just needed to find the right person with the right method and the right medication and the right knowledge to know what what to, uh, what to suggest, what to look for. Well, Sarah, I appreciate you so much coming on the show and sharing your experience with our viewers. We appreciate that so much. You and Sammy, we're glad that Sammy's doing better. We know you still have a lot of work to do because, again, the medication is not a silver bullet. It's not going to cure your dog, but it is an adjunct, a therapeutic tool along with training and behavior modification so that we can bring out the best in your dog. And we can increase the quality of their life so that they don't have to suffer. And one other question for you is, Mm -hmm. is Sammy a zombie? No, not at all. If, Um, if, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, if a stranger were to see Sammy, you know, at least at a distance that's below his threshold, um, would they know that Sammy is drugged up? Absolutely not. We've actually introduced him to, I believe, six strangers within the past two weeks. And one of them was like, are you sure this is an older dog? He has so much energy. He's so playful. That's what I love Um, to hear. Yeah, he is not a zombie at all. Um, My partner is Sammy's favorite person. And as soon as he gets home from work, all Sammy wants to do is play with him. So he is not a zombie whatsoever. And, and I appreciate you sharing that because, again, I think that is the number one fear, the number one concern when people think about uh, behavior medicine. We recommend yeah. that. Again, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Um, you have a wonderful weekend. We're going to get back into this subject, and uh, we'll talk soon. So, folks, um, that was Sarah talking about Sammy. Yeah. Now, individual results are going to vary. Absolutely. Some dogs are going to do a little bit better. Some dogs are not going to do as well. And the thing about medication, all right, there's no perfect formula. No. 
I wish there was. There's no perfect formula to say, okay, this is exactly the medication you need. This is exactly the dosage that you need. Sometimes we've got to play around with different medications to find the right one. Sometimes we've got to play around with dosages to find the right dose. And sometimes we need a combination of medications. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to talk about sedatives. Let's do it. Because we've been talking about antidepressants. Clomipramine is a tricyclic yeah. antidepressant. Tricyclic just means it's working with three different neurotransmitters, yeah, norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. Yeah. Prozac is an SSRI, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It works with serotonin, but it doesn't work with all the serotonin right. receptors. There are specific serotonin receptors that it works with. Yeah. Now, SSRIs, TSAs, they do not make dogs a zombie. Now, there are some potential very short-term side effects when a dog starts Prozac the yeah. first three weeks. Sometimes we see them a little tired. Yeah, absolutely. A little bit of a decreased appetite. But that goes away. Yeah. That doesn't stay that way. You see them at six and eight weeks, you don't see any of that. Yeah. And you're just like, it's just a normal dog again, except yeah. when it's the right medication. A lot of times the problems that we were giving that medication for have really decreased. And the thing about those medications, like I said, they're very specific Yeah, on how they target the brain. And what a lot of people don't realize is that when you have a neurochemical deficiency yeah. and you give these type of medications that are very specifically, say, blocking the reuptake of serotonin, yeah. so that increases the serotonin that exactly. stays in the brain, or norepinephrine, or dopamine, okay? When we are looking at that brain chemistry... And we're playing around with these type of medications because they are so specific. If the dog does not have a deficiency in those neurotransmitters, we are going to see little to no help at all. Exactly. Look at what happened with Prozac and Sarah's dog, Sammy. It's very obvious that most of Sammy's problem is not a serotonin issue. Yeah. It's norepinephrine and dopamine. dopamine. Oh, there's a little bit of serotonin issue bit. there. Trust me. But when we had a medication that only targeted serotonin, it didn't work. Exactly. And what I try to tell people is that, listen, there's no good way to definitively know that your dog has, yeah. a ser- or has a neurochemical deficiency. Oh, we could do a spinal, a spinal tap, tap yeah. and draw cerebral spinal fluid and send it out to a veterinary it's gonna be school. Invasive. It's going to be painful. We're going to, be- and we got to send it to a, a, like Tufts university to their uh, veterinary school and their research facility, because we don't do that. We don't test people that way. Yeah. So what we do is we have a suspicion that there's a neurochemical imbalance. It's a contributing factor, not yeah. the total cause. And we suspect that a medication might help. And so we use that medication as a treatment. Yeah. But we also use it as a diagnostic tool. Yeah. To verify our suspicions. Absolutely. And it's like, okay, if it helps, all right, we know that we are on target. But again, most veterinarians, yeah, they know about Prozac. That's about it. That's the only thing they know to do. And Prozac is just one of many medications. Many. So, Will, you said something about sedatives. Yeah. So those medications don't sedate. But there are sedatives and medications that are not necessarily sedatives, but they have side effects. Yeah. And the side effects are very sedating. Yeah. Um, Now, when could a sedative be warranted? Okay. So... Let's say that you have a dog that absolutely panics. I mean panics, panics, panics on a car ride. Yeah. Okay. The dog's drooling. It's panting. It's crying. It's screaming. Yeah. It's peeing itself. It's defecating. It is panicking. But you got to take the dog to the vet. Yeah, we got to get it to the vet so that we can get or, it onto something Or else, we've right? got a dog that when they go to the vet acts that way. And maybe they get aggressive and bite, okay? 
Well, in those situations, sedatives are appropriate because, number one, you don't want your dog to suffer. Yeah. And if you're against the medication and you can see your dog suffering like that, stop watching my show. I don't like you. You're mean. You're evil. Sorry. If you want your dog to suffer and it doesn't have to. Now, do you want your dog taking that every day and being a zombie? Absolutely not. That is a rare as needed medication until you've done the work, until you found the right medications that don't sedate, if they are needed and warranted, until you've done the behavior modification that you need to do. Those things help. If we've got a dog that maybe has to fly and has horrible travel anxiety, okay, I know people are going to tell me, yeah, the airlines say don't sedate your dog. I'm not telling you what to do. I'll tell you what I do. Sedate my dog. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. Um, But to me, the problem with sedatives are this. We have some veterinarians that like to prescribe a sedative for a behavioral problem, you know, uh, like uh, separation anxiety, aggression, a dog that's got noise phobias. And here's the thing. With sedatives, unless the dog is almost completely knocked out unconscious, yeah. Yeah. the vast majority of dogs, when they have a sedative, get more anxious more fearful absolutely let's and let me i actually have a a metaphor that i like to tell for that imagine that imagine that you are drinking a uh, cup of apple juice right and you have never in your life ever even heard of the word alcohol or being drunk anything like that not that you've never been drunk you've never even heard the words but this apple juice is actually whiskey okay next thing you know you're five glasses into your apple juice and you start losing motor function, your vision's getting a little hazy, you can't really feel your arms and your legs, and maybe your your balance is off, you're going to freak out. You have no idea what's, what's going wrong. on. What's exactly. wrong? What's going on in my world? Exactly. That would be very scary. Yeah. And that's what happens to your dog when you sedate them. They don't know why they're sedated. They don't know why their body is acting like this. They don't know what's happening. Now- There are some dogs, but it's the minority in our experience that they can be moderately sedated and they're calm and relaxed. Yeah. I'm not saying that it doesn't help all dogs, but for the majority of dogs, you know, it, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's going to make them more anxious and more nervous. So some of you may have had your veterinarians prescribe trazodone and trazodone is an atypical antipsychotic or excuse me, atypical antidepressant. We do not uh, prescribe trazodone anymore as an antidepressant for humans, but we do use it for insomnia. Yeah. Because one of the side effects of trazodone is it makes you very sleepy. Absolutely. Because it binds to the histamine receptors in the brain. And if it's got a strong binding to the histamine receptor, that makes you tired. And that's one of the things that trazodone does. And they like to give it to people because it's non-addicting, yeah. but yet it helps them be very tired. Yeah. Um, vets like to prescribe that a lot. Gabapentin. Yeah. Gabapentin now, interestingly enough, is an anti-convulsant yeah. medication, but it also has sedating side effects. Yeah. And the gabapentin, um, again, not addicting. And so they use that sometimes to yeah. sedate ace promazine um that's pretty old school today in 2022 um it's still being used as a sedative it primarily is used as a uh pre pre-anesthetic. Yeah. Pre- pre-anesthetic yeah um but ace promazine is an old old antipsychotic. yeah it's really not it sedates but it's not a true uh, sedative hypnotic it, it's yeah. a uh, antipsychotic medication yeah. Um, and there's lots of different medications. Sometimes we use medications that are blood pressure medicines. Yeah. Like beta blockers and alpha blockers, yeah. clonidine, yep. propanolol. Um, one of the things that can happen when a dog is extremely fearful or extremely reactive because of their fear, yeah. extremely aggressive is, you know, they go into that fight or flight, they're explosive, um, 
their heart rate has gone way up, their blood pressure is way up, their respiration is really high. Those are physiological responses to the emotional underlying yeah. emotional state. No, absolutely. And so with medications like clonidine and propanolol, yeah. um, they are going to help to block norepinephrine. Absolutely. I, I've, I've had clients where the Prozac did fantastic, but the problem is we couldn't get the training done because when the dog triggered, it was so extremely wham. And it would just it go from zero to 100 so fast that there was no discernible realm of that threshold. I, I couldn't even get close to threshold because if I even got anywhere near the threshold where in what I call my range of effectiveness for training, mm -hmm. the dog would just go insane berserk. So we started clonidine. Right. And, and that doesn't sedate. Yeah, yeah. At high levels it does, but we don't use it at right. high levels. We use it at, we use it at such lo lower than you would dose for blood pressure. Oh, Obviously, so we're not going to tank out the blood pressure, right. right? That would be dangerous. But we are able to calm yeah. the dog down because it changes those physiological responses for fight or flight. Exactly. And that is a not a daily medication. That's an as needed. And as needed. we may use that to help aid us with the behavior modification, right. the counter conditioning, the desensitization, so that it's doable. Exactly. Still difficult. And that was and that's that's what I want people to realize. Still difficult. I I I I am not a trainer that I go, oh my gosh, you have an aggressive or anxious dog. We're gonna do medication. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm gonna evaluate your dog and be like, you know what? I can't get this job done without some sort of neurochemical balancing. Because there's something going on in your dog's brain. The medication, there was a question in the comments that I actually really want to address. Right, they said, how long do the dogs typically have to stay on the medication? Well, my this is my yeah. rule of thumb. Yeah. My rule of thumb is I want at least one year yeah. of stable behavior. Absolutely. And if they've had a year of stable behavior, wean them off of the medication slowly. However, there's going to be some dogs that are going to be just fine. There are going to be some dogs you start weaning them off the medication and you start seeing all these problems that are neurochemical in nature come back. And those dogs typically need to be on it the rest of their life. That's not every dog. Right. And we don't know till we try. But again, my rule of thumb, and everybody might be different. My rule of thumb is I want to see one year of stable, good behavior exactly first. exactly precisely okay. and we need to do the work we need to do the behavior modification yeah. we need to do the counter conditioning the yeah. desensitization you need the meds to help with the training and you need the training to boost the meds and, and to hand in take hand. the to deal with the component that's not a neurochemical exactly. or a genetic or a physiological or neurobiological component exactly okay if pain is a component oh, to your yeah. dog's aggression. No amount of training and behavior modification is going to change that pain Absolutely issue. Absolutely not. That's a medical issue has got to be addressed. I had a dog, I had a dog that uh, the problem was we had early onset hip dysplasia. And the reason why I started to look at that was because the client was telling me, you know, the dog is a sweetheart, even to strangers, to other dogs, to people. But the only time that this dog ever aggresses, and it will happen 100% of the time, is if you approach the dog from behind. And I was like, interesting. So then I decided, I was like, hey, have your dog walk around a little bit for me. And I started watching the dog's gait. And I noticed that there was some pretty interesting sway in the dog's gait. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, let's go on and uh, get an x-ray on this dog's hips. I'm Go tell your vet that I'm recommending that they look a little bit deeper into your dog's hips. Sure enough, beginning signs of hip dysplasia, we put the dog onto a joint supplement. Man, turned it around. The, the aggression change? almost went yeah. away entirely. Now, that's not every dog. No. But in that case, again, we need to take a look at the whole animal and we need to treat every aspect yeah. of that animal. We're going to look for hormonal imbalances. Yeah. We're going to look for pain, everything. But this is about behavioral medicine. Um, and the thing about it is, folks, you really need to work with somebody that knows what they're doing. Absolutely. Um, a little bit of information can be dangerous. Yeah. And um, 
this is not an easy topic. I mean, again, I know a lot of veterinarians that they don't know. They don't know that they don't know. They're not being malicious. They just don't have the training. They don't have the education. Um, I'm fortunate that it is an area that has been a passion of mine for decades. I'm fortunate that this guy decided to take me under his wing and teach me. (laughs) And, you know, so I've studied uh, neurochemistry, psychopharmacology, um, the Bible, the Bible for behavioral medicine and small animals is uh, by Karen Overall. And oh, wow. You that's, can see that's a pretty dog-eared. I know uh, what I'm getting him for Christmas, copy. guys. I think this he is, needs a I, new copy. I'm, actually, I'm passing this. <laughs> this is the baton. I will pass it on when I retire. And your job is to keep that together. <laughs> to keep it together. Till the next yeah. person, right? <laughs> okay. okay. Um, but, you know, I'm ben- I, I, I worked in... Uh, psychiatry in that field. Uh, my wife's a psychiatrist, you know, so very familiar with psychopharmacology. Absolutely. Um, and I'm grateful. Yeah. And I don't expect a lot of people to have that knowledge, that information, unless yeah. they have a passion. Right. Um, but folks, you need to see a veterinary behaviorist. Absolutely. They're the definitive people that really understand this the fullest. Um, you we might- recommend to veterinary behaviors all the time, all the time, very often. There are so many times where you, we have to recognize, we one recognize that your regular veterinarian doesn't know that they don't know. And then we recognize that we do know that we may not know. Right. And it happens so often that we're looking at a case and I, and I come to Will and I'm like, Will, listen, A, B, C, D, I've tried this. I've tried that. Mm-hmm. Like, what, what do you recommend? And then Will looks at me and goes, Jordan. This is outside of our area of expertise. Yep. It is time for us to recommend out. Yeah. It happens very often. You have to go to the right person. Yeah. You have to go to the right person. And again, I want to emphasize, we don't look at every dog and say, hey, let's medicate them. Yeah. There's a lot of dogs that we don't medicate. There's plenty of dogs where I go, you know what? I really don't want to do medication with this dog. Let's do the training first. And there are some dogs that we start the training and after a couple months, it becomes very apparent we're not getting very far. Yeah. And we may have been on the fence with medication. Yeah. We started training and behavior modification first. We do that a lot. We start training and behavior modification first. But the thing I want to emphasize, behavioral medicine is not a last resort. No. For many dogs, if you don't start with medication you will not be able to do the training. Anywhere. You will not be able to do the behavior modification. Yeah. One of the biggest areas is severe separation anxiety. Absolutely. You can forget dealing with severe it's separation so anxiety with behavior modification alone. Absolutely. You are going to need medication and behavior modification. And Another we, one, owner-directed aggression. Yeah, owner-directed yeah. aggression. But one of the things, you know, when I talk about severe separation anxiety with the pandemic, we've had so much more of that. And we know as a result of that, what the gold standard is. Now, that doesn't mean every dog with separation anxiety uh, that we need to. Or every dog with owner directed aggression needs to be medicated. Exactly. Again, remember, what did we talk about? Is it is the dog when the dog reacts to the trigger? Yeah. Is it a real threat? appropriate for the dog to react that way or is it imagined is it is it um oh my gosh proportionate yes you know you know maybe the response should be a level one response and the dog's a level 10 exactly and maybe normally um when somebody closed the door and it made a loud noise a normal dog would maybe be startled but then five seconds later they're normal they lay their head down they're cool And your dog is trembling for 20 minutes. Yeah, that's a problem. Okay. And those things are abnormal pathological behaviors. And they're responding more to internal stimuli. Exactly. Versus external. Yeah, exactly. And that's the, those are the things that we have to look at. And so if I can get one singular message across, that message is, I don't think that every dog needs medication. However, there are plenty of dogs out there that do. And so that is not necessarily for me to determine. Honestly, at the end of the day, when I see a dog like Sammy, I looked at Will and I said, I think maybe this dog needs medication. Will goes, 
you know, I kind of agree. I think that maybe we should recommend clomipramine. And I was like, that's what I was thinking as well. However, at the end of the day, it, that wasn't our decision. We had to pass that recommendation on to their veterinarian and their veterinarian then did their research and they agreed. They concurred with our solution. My point is. It helps a little bit that their decision to put the dog on Prozac didn't, yeah, didn't exactly. work. Exactly. Right. Right. Of course. And so my point is. Look to the experts. This podcast, if you're listening afterwards, this video, if you're hearing us live right now, is nothing more than us sharing what is our experience in this subject matter. And that's all we want to do is we want to educate people so that you can make better informed decisions with your pet. Yeah. So do us a favor, hit that like button, show us some love, hit the share button, yeah. share this video to your Facebook page, to your timeline yeah. so that more people that may have a dog that's yeah. suffering and they may have a dog where the reaction is just overkill big yeah. time and the dog doesn't recover. It stays trembling for days, hides for days. Um, the dog's truly yeah. suffering and, and you know, they don't Will, need to be, you know, you're right. No. And that's, that's what I care about is the suffering, the quality of life. Right. At the end of the day, I've told so many clients, I say, I hate to say it folks, but in the beginning I'm here for your dog. <laughs> and, and, and here's the thing. And difficult. I'm glad you said the quality yeah. of life, because if medicating a dog meant yeah meant that the quality of their life would go down, we would never, never. why would we do something like that? I mean, Absolutely anybody not. that would want to do something that would make a dog or any animal's quality of life go down, yeah. that, that's just insane. What is wrong with you? But, now, but people sometimes get things wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And again, they don't know that they don't know. They don't know that they don't know. And here's the thing. I'm actually seeing a lot of questions. We, are, we do not have time. I'm sorry, guys. We are running out of time. I have another client to get to. Sometimes we can do a whole extra hour. And this is a topic that maybe does need some more time. But I'm seeing a lot of people asking about things like supplements and CBD and stuff okay, like that. Okay, so I'm just going to, you know, we can have a show just on That's supplements and CBD. That's what I was um, thinking. All I'm going to tell you is that supplements and CBD are unregulated by the FDA. I will tell you that the FDA has issued a warning to not give CBD to your pets. Yeah. They have not done enough research on it. Um, yes, they are a mammal like a human being. However, THC is not toxic for humans. It, is, it is extremely toxic for pets. Yep. And CBD has some, a very small amount very of THC minute. in it. We are finding out more with cats, much more with cats and dogs, that um, long-term use of CBD is causing liver problems. Ah, look at that. Liver enzymes are going up. And so that's why it's important to follow the science um, I can talk more about CBD, but this is not the show for yeah, that. Yeah. Um, if I really wanted to talk about supplements, I'd be pitching my own supplement. I'm not doing that. Yeah. This is not what it's about. I'm not here to sell you anything, but, um, I appreciate everybody for listening. I'm sorry if you have questions and we couldn't get to the questions yeah. today. Um, if you had a question about a specific medication and what your dog should take, um, we would refer you to a veterinary behaviorist yeah. anyway. Um, again, I did see a question in there that said that was asking if we specifically us at Phoenix dog training can come out to evaluate your dog. I can't remember who said that. Yeah, we Shoot can us an email. Yeah. Go to go to the website, Phoenix dog training.com. Again, it's Phoenix dog training.com. Fill out the uh, contact form when you get there. Yeah. And in the comment section, will you just mention that you were listening to Pet Talk today, the episode on behavioral medicine. So um, that kind of stands yeah. out to us. Yeah. We do get a lot of people contacting us and, on a and, daily basis, and we cannot get back to everybody yeah. right away. And here's it the may next take thing. us days to get back to you. Here's and I, the so, next I'm thing. sorry, but we're yeah. in great demand. And you don't have to live in the valley either. No. We do virtual evaluations all the time. And a lot of people are like, well, don't you need to see my dog? No. Let me tell you something. No. What can your dog speak to me? What can they tell me? Yeah. What can your dog tell me? They can't tell me anything. All what we need to know comes from a very, very, very thorough history and interview yeah. of the owner. Exactly. We believe you Absolutely. when you tell us those things. Absolutely. And, and I kid you not. We know how lesson, to ask the right questions. Yeah. My first lesson with a dog that has aggression and anxiety, fears, phobias is two hours long normally. During those two hours, I may see your dog for five minutes. Yeah. 
And, and, you know, we, we, I do behavior consults all over the country and in yeah. Canada. Um, so yeah, if you're not in Arizona, that's okay. Um, we can still help you out and we help can still recommend, and we can also refer you to the right veterinary behaviors exactly. in your part of the country or world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or world because we are heard worldwide in 78 countries. Yeah. Oh, let me just say this before I go. Had a lady that sent me a wonderful email yeah. from uh, South Africa. Yeah. And she's a, she loves the show. She says she's learning a lot. Really appreciate it. She's actually going to school to be an animal behaviorist. Look at that. And she said that she loves to listen to the show because she learns so much. So that made us feel good. Yeah. If you like us, if you love us, give us a thumbs up. Hit that share button. And please. we appreciate everybody uh, for today. And please tell your friends and family about Pet Talk today. Um, we're going to be back next Saturday again with another show. We don't have a topic picked out for next Saturday. Not but just yet. We'll have one and you'll see it put up. Make sure you check back to the uh, Pet Talk Today page to find out what we're going to be talking about next Saturday. And again, we're here from 12 noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock Pacific Time. We'll see you next week, everybody.